Hi, this is Kara Mayer Robinson. Welcome to Really Famous, where I talk to famous people and cut through the fluff to get to what they really think and how they really feel. My guest today is Zoe Lister Jones. You know that show, Life in Pieces? It's a sitcom on CBS. It's really funny. She plays Jen, a young mom married to the Colin Hanks character, whose name is Greg on the show, and they've got a baby named Lark. They are pretty hilarious on the show, and Zoe is super quick and witty. She's got great timing, and you just get that sense when you watch her that she's got it all together. In real life, Zoe is not only hilarious, she is incredibly talented. Zoe is also a filmmaker. On June 2nd, her film Band-Aid comes out in theaters. It is so funny and it is such a tearjerker. Like all at once, it's a great film. Not only did she write Band-Aid, but she also produced it, she directed it, and she stars in it, along with Adam Pally and Fred Armisen. And there are like a bazillion faces that you'll recognize throughout the movie, like her Life in Pieces co-star, Angelique Cabral, and Ravi Patel. Zoe and I sat down recently, we talked about the film, what it's like working on Life in Pieces, and we got into some other stuff like marriage and divorce. In fact, she shares some pretty interesting bits that may surprise you. Zoe is one of those people who you think that you kind of know in real life because of the kind of character she plays on TV, but you'll realize that there's a lot more to Zoe than meets the eye. Oh, and she also shares some, let's say, interesting practices that she does in her spare time. Here's Zoe Lister-Jones. Zoe, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So I'm super excited about your film, Bandy. Thank you. I saw it the other day, and I have to tell you, I loved it. Now, I don't, <laughs> I really need you to understand, I don't just hand over praise wow. to anybody. But really, the film moved me. Thank you so much. It's amazing. It was like hilarious, and it was sad, and I was I had tears like, oh. many times. Is this the reaction you're getting? It is the reaction I'm getting, which is like so gratifying as a filmmaker to to hear that it moves people and 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 moves them in different ways, you know, to laughter and sometimes tears. The story, just for a little background, um, is about a couple, a young couple, going through some stuff, and they're fighting a lot. Thank um, you for calling me young. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative. No, I love it. I love it. Keep going. So a young couple going through some stuff. Uh-huh. Very, like, normal stuff. It was really, I felt like, a page out of the book of almost any couple. Yeah. Um, and so they're going to, through some struggles, not to give away too much stuff. They're fighting a ton. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's superficial stuff, but then you get to some deeper stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is an emotional movie, but right off the bat, you're laughing. <laughs> so how are you in real life? Are you a funny person? Are you a serious person? A combination of both, like Band-Aid is? Yeah, I think I'm a combination of both. Um, you know, I... I I like having fun and, and being funny, and I've worked a lot as an actress in comedy. Um, but I also, you know, encounter sadness <laughs> all the time. <laughs> um, and I think that is just what real life is. And, and I think for couples, too, like, I appreciate you saying that, that they felt, the fights kind of felt really universal, because I think it is so, um, it's so often that couples fight, but it's so rare that they talk about it. Like, it's, even with friends, like, it's something that I think couples don't want to admit because then it would seem like that re- their relationship might have cracks in it or that they might be judged by their friends but I, then once I started talking to a lot of my friends in long-term relationships we were all kind of having the same fight like the, the, the fights that I think at least heterosexual couples have often fall along gendered lines and they're about the same things primarily like dishes <laughs> cleaning up after oneself um, and that drip. And yeah, the drip. You know, I won't give anything away, but the drip for sure, like that happened in the beginning, you mm-hmm. see it happening, it's like, that is it. And it drove you crazy. And you didn't show too much about how you were feeling about that drip, but just like, yeah, you could see it. The kitchen sink is dripping in this couple's home and Thanks. they, and they, um, they just live with it for so long and nobody's fixing it. And obviously that's sort of a metaphor for um, their relationship that, that I think, and for me just in general, I think that that is kind of one of the, 
biggest lessons I've learned so far, uh, I've been with my now husband for 13 years, um, is that like to choose to stay in a relationship means that you have to acknowledge all of the things that are going to constantly need little fixes or big fixes or big fixes, but um, but that every relationship needs repair. And I think it's like, it's when you don't acknowledge that, that then a relationship is really in trouble. Right, so did somebody warn you about that? Or are you really like in your 13 years, that's where you figured that no, out? No, I think I've just been figuring it out. <laughs> How, so when did you start figuring that out? Um, probably like year four. <laughs> it's been a slow burn. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. always is. Yeah. But at the same time, year four is still pretty soon to realize, okay, this is how it's going to be. You well, know, I yeah. think a lot of people are sort of waiting for Prince Charming or whatever else. And if totally. the marriage doesn't feel like that, then they're like, well, this uh, maybe this isn't meant to be. Yeah. And I think there's so many things that like we absorb in popular culture that like make us believe that like this is what a perfect relationship is or this is what a perfect partner is and then when you hold like real life relationships and real life partners up to those standards you're never gonna last <laughs> not at all <laughs> because they're all gonna be disasters in one way or another and it's about you know the, the disasters you choose to live with <laughs> right. and I guess yeah. as long as you can see it as a disaster that you're choosing to live with and yeah. You can live with it. Yeah, because I think if you're always chasing something that's perfect, you're never going to be satisfied. Right. I'm going to go back for a second to something I said that you commented on, which is a young couple, like a normal young couple going through stuff. Uh -huh. So I think also your film is a little rare in the fact that it's taking like two people who seem very regular, real, like I think very relatable. Thanks. And I feel like that's not really what you're seeing in pop culture right now much. Do you think that way too or is that just me? I do, yeah. I think like in in our sort of Instagram obsessed culture, there's a lot of um, attention paid to like being perfect and like putting an image of yourself out that's perfect and I fall prey to it too you know it, it's hard not to want to live up to like this this idea of especially for women I think of what women should be looking like right now or acting like right now and um, and I think in films too uh, especially in like comedies there's often like a gloss kind of laid over them and for me it was really important that that this wasn't um, glossy or or um, inauthentic any, in any way. I really wanted the characters to be people that they could see themselves in. So what exactly does it take to, I mean I know this isn't your first film, but to write a whole film, uh -huh. <laughs> produce it, act in it, you directed it too, yep. right? Well, what the heck? How do you do something <laughs> like that? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I, I, I love making... Um, Seems big. Making things, yeah. It is. I, I think it's it's so empowering, especially when like I make my living as an actress, and and so it's really nice to be able to create roles for myself that I can kind of um, nurture from soup to nuts, you know, that I that I have a lot of creative autonomy mm -hmm. with, and that I'm not sitting around waiting for the phone to ring, right. which is really nice, um, especially because I think right now, especially. I just said especially twice. Hello, good morning. Um, I think right Wait, now. Wait, that's really. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm wild. Especially twice. Wow. Um, <laughs> I think in, especially, especially in this uh, time for, for filmmaking, there's a very small list of actresses that can like get a film made and so it's really limiting in terms of getting work in in the film space I think the TV space it's really different so um so it's easier in the TV space I think yeah it's because there are more roles or yeah there's just more there's more roles and I think in order um like the sort of financing model um in TV doesn't rely quite as much on like what face is valuable in a foreign market um okay. so like a face that is valuable in a foreign market it has to be someone who's like been in a f franchises like big big blockbuster movies which is only like a handful of <laughs> people and are we talking about we're talking about women though or we're talking about men uh, and women both both men and women but i can only speak as a as a female actress that that that's been my experience so it's it's really nice to be able to make my own work um but but then i also have always been um a writer and um and that's been something that even in high school I was 
I didn't know if I wanted to pursue acting or writing. So it's really nice to be able to do both. And um, so why limit yourself to one, really? Yeah, if, it, you, if it, you are passionate about both. Totally. And then directing just felt like the next logical step. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, you, I suspect just from watching the film, and obviously I've been watching you on TV too, and Life in Pieces, I really do like, I oh, love it, thanks. I have to tell you, I've even talked about it on the podcast oh, with other cool. guests, and I, I talked about it with Tim Gunn recently. Really? You know Tim Gunn? Yes, because he was on. Oh, that's right. He did an, I think he did no. a guest star, didn't he? Wait, stop. He yeah, did he, he did a guest star. On Life in Pieces? I think so. He was definitely on How I Met Your Mother. Let's fact check it. We need to fact check that. Let me do that. And I'm you doing can it, I'm doing okay. it. Okay. Oh no, you want to do it? Okay, you Yeah, do it. I'll do it. Because I, we talked about we talked about how I met your mom. No, I know he couldn't have. I, mean, I don't even have to fact check because I talked to him recently, and he told me that one of his shows that he watches is like he. You know what? Maybe maybe that's what I'm remembering. Maybe he said like he tweeted something about it, and then everyone on the show was like, "We should get him on." Okay, so he didn't. T I don't think he tweeted about it because I've been following his tweets since our podcast. However, wow, you are obsessed with Tim Gunn. Well, he's my. He was. <laughs> I'll have to tell you, he was my first guest on the podcast. He was, and. I adore Tim. I can't. I can't hide it. But I'll tell you what. When we brought up what TV shows we w both watch, he said Life in Pieces That's is one so of his cool. favorites. And I said, Who is your favorite couple on the show? And he said, Oh, uh, and uh, Colin. Colin Hanks. Oh my God, that's amazing. And I couldn't agree more. So it um, comes up. That's amazing. I was. I was trying to fact check. I think you're right. You're the Tim Gunn expert. I'm going to leave this to you. Okay. Um, yeah, that's so. That's so he great. He should go on the show. Then he I should think come he on the show. Yes. Yeah. They I think that's why I thought ask. he was because everyone was like, "We should get him on." Do yeah. It. But I was going off track. Okay. So watching the film really made me think that you must be like a very analytical, <laughs> intelligent, like very. You're think you're a cerebral person. I yes, would guess. Totally. Is that you? Have yes. you always been like that? Yeah, I'm a Jewish New Yorker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it doesn't get more like neurotic and analytical than that. Um, yeah, I, I think I think I've I, I my mom also is a an intellectual, but she is a person who's like really um, speaks like therapy talk. <laughs> Was she, she a therapist? No, she's an artist, but she's gone to therapy for a long time. Um, and a lot of her friends are therapists. But I think I was raised also with that sort of um, approach to life, like trying to, to unpack things a lot emotionally and, and figure people out in that way, which also helps, you know, as an artist. But, um, but yes, I definitely am so cerebral. You've, and you've always been in your head a lot, do you think? Or yes. Yeah, totally. So, how, so is that, that's probably good and bad, right? It is good and bad, yeah. And I think that that was a big part of writing this film too, was kind of exploring, I think I think women, not to make generalizations, but women generally are in our heads a lot more um, and are constantly analyzing and kind of trying to figure out why someone's doing something and if it's personal and how it makes us feel and all of these things that make us really empathetic people um, and I think men approach things quite differently generally speaking again um, and that this movie really does deal with how how those differences impact relationship and, and how maybe they can be bridged but um, but th there is a scene in the movie where um, not to give anything away but where um, my character really does have to enter her physical body in a new way because I do think that I've been going to this this really interesting practitioner in LA. I've now become so LA because now I live in LA. But I go to this like like body work practitioner, and her whole thing is how to like get in your body because she's like so many women are basically like cut off from the waist down. Like we're just like always in our heads. But like to really live in your body like is something that's so rare, especially in our world now. Like we're all on our phones. We're all we're very much right, like that's upper body too. Living. It's just our upper body. It's just our hands. My thumbs are in amazing shape. Um, but but yeah, I think it is like it's a challenge for all people, but I do think for women also, um, to really like inhabit our bodies, especially because there's so many other things that come with a woman's body from, from birth. It's like shame, pressure, sexualization, all of these things. So this body practitioner, what is it called, body? Yeah, it, it's called the Grinberg method. Okay, <laughs> so the Grinberg method, you get, what do you do? Um, I take my clothes off, I lie on a table, 
and um, and and my practitioner basically like finds where I'm holding emotions in my body and tries to release them as I talk through it. So it's like talk therapy, but it's actually like finding where it is in your body. So you said it's a she? Yeah. So is she kind of feeling around for a little like tension or something? And then as she's feeling, you're saying you're yeah. working through? She's very intuitive. She doesn't, it doesn't take much. Like she's just like, she'll just like put her finger on a spot and you'll be like, oh my God, that hurts so much. But it's a spot that you never would think like would hurt. Um, it's very cool. That's I'm interesting. Into it. Yeah. So how often do you do that? I go once a week. Okay. And you feel good afterwards? I feel great. I feel great. I totally am a, I'm a proponent of, of therapy in whatever form is helpful to, to, to the individual. To but it. I think it is so important. Yeah. So growing up then, did you, did you have a lot of therapy too? After my parents got divorced, I, my mom took me to a therapist, but I, I didn't love it. I think finding the right therapist is the biggest kind of like challenge. Finding someone who works for you because it's it's so subjective and so it's so personal and i think a lot of people give up on it too soon because yeah. it's not the right fit yeah and that's unfortunate but i think also you have to kind of be in the right mindset to yeah start you have to want to and dig in and dig in yeah um full disclosure <laughs> i was a therapist before I was you a- were oh my <laughs> god now you're asking some very insightful questions so that makes sense so we're all right so growing up in brooklyn brooklyn you said mm-hmm. what was it like uh, it was scary. <laughs> Were you in a bad neighborhood? Yeah, I wasn't in a great neighborhood. What neighborhood? Um, I, was, I was on the south end of Park Slope, but it was basically bordering Sunset Park. Um, it was a 15th Street between 4th and 5th, for people who know where that is. And it was the 80s, so it was a very different Brooklyn than Brooklyn is now. And uh, my parents are both artists, so they always were kind of pioneering neighborhoods that um, that were a little bit more rough around the edges because they couldn't afford other places to I live. I love that term. They were pioneering neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, because especially in New York, that's what basically happens, right? It's like a couple artists who can't afford um, to live in the city or now in Brooklyn yeah. will go to the next sort of neighborhood and then uh, all of this awful gentrification <laughs> happens. Right, and they're pushed and out now, further. Yeah, and now, and now there's nowhere affordable to live in New York, but... Um, but yeah, so so Brooklyn was, um, it was, I definitely felt scared as a kid, but I also really loved growing up in New York. I, I my parents were both part of the visual art world, so we were going to a lot of gallery openings and a lot of museums and um, had very interesting friends and uh, I went to public school and yeah, it was cool. What age were you when they got divorced? I was nine. Okay, so that's yeah. a little tough. It was, yeah, it was definitely tough. And I think it totally influenced um, the work that I make, especially with this film. Like Be- how? Well, because I think that, that those questions around why couples choose to stay together and when they choose to throw in the towel is something that I've been, you know, really interested in for my entire life. Like, wh- wh- and, and even looking at my parents now and being like, could they have worked it out? You know, like, could there have been something is it is it just a matter of um, pushing through or accepting ones? When do you when do you stop trying to make it work? I guess is is always the question for right. me. Right. So were you so. you did a lot of analyzing of that then and ever since? I guess. Yeah, I think it's just always been something that's lived in me, and then and then of course has transferred into my own relationships. How so? Um, just like, well, I've been with my husband as I mentioned now since we were twenty one. So I think especially when you're with someone from a very young age, like the idea of forever brings up a lot of questions like, is this the right person? What does the right person mean? Do we evolve together or are our differences too big to kind of cross, you know? And and I think what's been really beautiful about my relationship is that we, we have grown together and we've chosen to stay together but there were many moments when we could have not and so I think that that is what's so interesting to me is like if in in those sliding doors moments like if we would have been like okay well we're not going to fight for this anymore um, we would be in really different places right yeah. now yeah and not that question when you look back on your parents do you think do you think maybe it was that one of those moments and they should have pushed through it? Have you concluded anything? I have no conclusions and I don't like I, it's too dangerous for me to try and do that because I was a kid so I can't like I know both of their versions of the story, but I think everything happens for a reason, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I think that that 
what's been really what, the thing that that works in my relationship is that we both want to change you know I think that you have to both want to constantly be evolving together otherwise you do kind of have to call it at a right. certain point and you have to accept the other person changing too yeah totally because if you expect that other person to be the same exact person forever yeah you know that's probably not gonna work out too well yeah you're screwed so what were some of the moments that you feel like they could have been they could have broken the whole situation well, the first uh, movie, my husband and I have made three films together. Um, we co-wrote and, and produced and st starred in the first one. He directed it. Um, it was called Breaking Upwards. And that was a movie that was uh, loosely based on an open relationship we were in. Um, so that was definitely trying. <laughs> so what, what happened there? Um, we, you know, we were young and, uh, and I think it was just one of those things where it was kind of like, is this, are we gonna be just with each other for the rest of our lives? Um, and I had just started acting and was like meeting all these cute boys and he was out, you know, we were just like out on the scene. You were like in your young, early 20s then? Uh, I was 21. That's yeah. super young. He was 20, so he was really young, especially for a guy, like that's really young. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so, I actually initiated the conversation and said, what if we, <laughs> they really love rolling these fucking chairs around. <laughs> Can they pick them up with their hands? It's chair moving day here at the <laughs> office. Um, yeah. So it was your idea. So it was my idea and I, um, I, I then, I think my, my now husband was kind of like weirded out by it because he actually comes from an intact home. And I think that that really does impact the way people view long-term relationships and marriage. So he was very much like, you're the one and we're gonna get married. And I was like, I don't believe in marriage and I don't know what this means. And so I think I had a lot of more skepticism around it than he did at first. But then we were in this open relationship where like we basically spent one, like three nights a week together and four nights a week apart. So it was like very structured. Like planned out? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so you were both living in the same place it, though? No, we had separate apartments. But I mean in the same city? The same city, yeah, in New York, yeah. And then, um, and then uh, it kind of evolved so that then on those days off we would be, we were allowed to, to see other people but we never would talk about it. Um, How did that go? Okay, at it first was is interesting my guess. at first. Yeah, we lasted about a year doing it, um, and I think it was important for us to do. But there were definitely plenty of moments towards the end where uh, it almost br broke us. So, were you? Did you talk about it, or was it we, one of those things that you were talking about before, where it uh, some couples just don't really even talk about it? We weren't talking about it. It was kind of a don't ask, don't tell situation. But then. Um, especially him, like he, he got a little sloppy. So like I would like find something of a girl's and then it started to get a little icky. And I, and because I think both of us were kind of like, they're not doing anything, you know, like in yeah. our, we wanted to just deny that the other person was doing anything while we were. And then I think the reality of the other person doing something, I was confronted with like, what a jealous person I realized I, I am. So what happened at that point? Did you discuss it and say, you know what? Oh good, they're lifting yeah, the they're chairs. they're lifting the chairs. We're putting this office to work. <laughs> they're gonna be so much more. Um, what did I just ask? What, did oh, you did you, so it? did you, when it started to feel icky, did you start talking about it and then yeah. come to some sort of agreement or did you drift or? Well basically like when we fir when I first suggested uh, the open relationship, he, I think, was hurt. And then by the end of it, the roles were reversed where I wanted to close the relationship and he was like, no way, this is fun. Ouch, <laughs> because yeah. especially I think for a dude, it's really different. Like I think that women relate to sex much differently um, for the most part. I'm not gonna speak for all women, but I think for the most part, it's harder to compartmentalize sex um, and, and separate it from emotion and for dudes that's like very easy comes very naturally um which is why they're all sleeping with their nannies and um <laughs> so i so so i feel like once he understood like oh i get this like person that i really love and is like my girlfriend and i also get to sleep with women on the side like that's a dude's dream um but for me i found it much more confusing so after that how did your relationship change 
I think I took it less for granted. Um, but I think it, I think it's always been something, I think it's healthy because that conversation is never off the table, which I think in when you're with someone for a really long time is really healthy because I think like, especially in, in our industry, he's a filmmaker, obviously, um, you're constantly connecting with other people. And for me as an actress, it's like constantly in these situations that I think you have to be able to acknowledge um, those connections without it being like devastating to a relationship. So I think it's helped in that way where it's like th those things don't scare us as much. Okay. I think the trick is just knowing that like, um, like f flirting is always going to be more fun than actually going for it. I feel like it, I, that's like a lesson that I learned when we were in the open relationship anyway is like casual sex kind of sucks. At least it did for me. I was like, this isn't <laughs> that much fun. Um, but flirting is fun and like, it, and it should be fun and like people should be able to have fun, I think, doing that. As long as it doesn't cross a certain line, I think it's so human to do that in, when you're in a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. So then there were some other moments you said that were almost like breaking moments? I mean, yeah, and just like normal things, you know, just I think. And did you ever almost walk away or? I think we had like intense sort of impasses where we had to ask a lot of tough questions for sure. But um, but I, I don't think we ever got to the point where we were really going to walk away. And so you've been married how long now? Four years. So how many more of these moments do you think there will be in life? Oh, God, hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> I think the way that a couple fights is such an insight into the way that they also love, you know? Because, like, if you are... If your fights are ultimately... I mean, fights can be really petty, and I hate, I hate like, fighting. But they also can be really... Um, instructive revealing and revealing and um, and if you can get past the sort of I think that what, like what couples fall into and that's what the film kind of deals with is like getting into the same fight over and over again like you have your triggers and you have your habits and you kind of just keep hitting the same wall it's like how you push through that and so in this movie that's that's through music <laughs> right and so and you've been into music your whole life yeah I've loved yeah I'm a big fan of of um, like listening to music I know that sounds kind of generic but yeah like music has always been incredibly meaningful to me um, and then I was in a band in high school and college and, and I've always been a sort of songwriter but uh, this is the fullest extent that I've really been in a band <laughs> so is this you like on screen kind of is this the expression of everything that has been inside of you for all this time in some ways I mean it's it's not an autobiography like there are f a lot of fictional elements but um, but it certainly, yeah, has a lot of pieces of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jen on Life in Pieces has differences uh, from me, but I also infuse a lot of myself mm -hmm. into her. So it's a mixed bag. It's all good. Yeah. So and you have a baby on the show. Um, no kids in the film. Yeah. What's the real life story? No kids. Yeah. Um, but I'm at I'm at the age where everyone's asking that question. <laughs> I know, and I don't mean to ask it in that way. This yeah. is what I ask. I ask everything that just happens to be one of yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, is it annoying at this point that everybody's asking? And I I have to believe it is. It is annoying. Yeah, but I get it. I mean, I think also because I've been we have been in a relationship for so long. That's also like the thing. But we didn't get married. We were together. Uh, for nine years before we got married. So that was also like that question was nonstop. When are you gonna get married? When are you gonna get married? So I think there are these like conventions in our totally. society that like these like benchmarks of pe when people expect you to do something um, that can kind of be frustrating when you're not right. hitting them at the moments that people want you to be. But interestingly, here you are making a film mm -hmm. and like that's a topic there. Like totally. right off the bat, you're at a child's birthday party because all of your friends have Yes, Kids. that's drawn from real life. Yes. <laughs> yeah, all of my friends, a lot, uh, most of my friends have kids. Yeah. What does that feel like? Um, it's just, uh, it's a shift in the social dynamic for sure. You know, it just changes. I think it changes my friends' social circles. It also changes their schedules. So, you know, it's an adjustment. Um, and then, uh, because we don't have kids, we are on a different schedule and, and don't have our mommy and me classes or our pick up and drop off or all of the things that then, you know, just become a, a part of the fabric of, of, you know, your friends' lives. So it's just about kind of 
shifting a little bit. Right. So does it help that you and your husband kind of can do your own things to kind of make a little? Yeah. I think it's I think it's tough because I like my friends with kids. I I admire and like I see all of the joy, but I also see all of the work and all of the struggle <laughs> that comes with raising kids and um, how little sleep they've gotten in like so many years that it's um. I do definitely still enjoy and relish my um, my my life as it is right now. Yeah, yeah. your peace, your yeah. freedom, your yeah. relaxation. So, what do you do when you're not working? I mean, I would think that you're constantly writing, producing, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. when you're not <laughs> acting. Because hello, there's a lot of stuff you have. Yeah, but there's got to be time downtime, right? Is there? Do you um, have there's any? not a ton of downtime. Um, only because I'm I am constantly. You know, we have about five months of hiatus, and um, so in that f in in that time, I'm generally just working on um, my own projects. Um, and then even when I'm on set on Life in Pieces, I'm also working on them because they're pretty nonstop. Especially when when you're wearing as many hats as I did on this yeah, one. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of hats. So you're you're working. You're and it's a network show, so it's not like you're you know there are 13 episodes and done. Yeah, no, we have 22. That's a lot of episodes. Yeah, but at least it's a half hour, right? That's probably less than. Yeah, and I, and the structure of the show helps right. too, because like, generally speaking, um, we get to shoot our 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 stuff, like Colin and my stuff, fairly quickly. Okay, so that's pretty good. So you do yeah. have that off time to work. So you're a workaholic in a way, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You love it. It's what you do for fun. Mm -hmm. What beyond the body work and the. <laughs> it's, it's filmmaking. Just, it's just therapy and filmmaking. Um, uh, <laughs> What what beyond? Um, it, that's actually like a big struggle for me right now is like how to really create downtime for myself because it's something that I, I've never been good at. So I'm trying to make more time to really um, just like do nothing. Why? Why do you feel like you important. need to? important. I think it's important. I think like it's really easy to get burnt out and I feel myself getting burnt out, but I, I like... I'm, I just continue to push through. I've been pushing through, I think, for like my whole life. <laughs> so I think now it's like, um, especially because like as a consumer, when I'm in the industry that is also creating the things that I consume, like so many people's downtime is like TV and movies and stuff. And that's also like my job. So whenever I'm watching stuff, it's hard to really like turn off Let the go. working mind it's also always about like oh that that has this influence on my work in this way or this is a good comp for this or um so i think yeah and i think like phones are, too are like a big problem like whenever i'm like okay i have a minute i'm just like uh, scrolling on my phone or checking my emails it just, it's so incessant like to really turn your brain off is is a big challenge it is a challenge and then you also probably feel pressure to be on the phone because you have so many totally. things in the mix right totally. so many like pans on the yeah stove yeah um, so, but you've never, you've always been like not a downtime person, even when you were a kid. Oh yeah, never. Well, what, what do you, how were you then? What did you do? Well, um, I feel like there's so much stimulation growing up in New York that like, just like my body doesn't know what relaxation really means, you know, because like as a kid in New York, there's never a moment that you, that you can be off guard. Like it, you have to really always have like your survival instincts up. There's no way, it's not like you get to go like, I never had a backyard. There was never a place that was just like, let's play. Like if you're in Prospect Park, like you still have to be really careful. Like if I was in the playground, I still have to be really careful. So I think that there's like, that's what I work on in my therapy is really, cause you have to retrain your, your brain really to be like, no, you can, all of these things that are like, Al alarms that go off in your mind are no longer alarms. Like you can turn them off. But they're unnecessary. They're yeah. alarms, they're but they're going off for no reason. Yeah. yeah. So you need to like shut them down or get them all yeah. out. And I think that comes with like the, it's really, uh, I'm, I am really motivated and a self starter, but I think that that also is part of it is like this obsession with being productive and kind of never letting yourself really just like chill <laughs> yeah so did somebody tell you like Zoe you really need to it's time for you to I mean I definitely get my adrenals checked a lot because I, I'm like one of many many people in our current world who have adrenal burnout <laughs> um, so that is part of like yeah my doctor's like you gotta chill a little bit more but 
Um, but it's hard because I also have a lot of, like, it's also what brings me joy. Yeah. This movie was so much fun to make. Like, it really was just the most fun. And we're still having so much fun because now we get to, like, play as a band. And it just continues to really, like, enrich in my life, even though it's work. So yeah. it's, a, it's a fine line. But are you going to, are you a little nervous about, like, when the there's a hush after the, it's almost like that post-wedding thing, right? Where you Totally. Um... I think, well, luckily, I don't know if this is luckily, but this is how sick I am that I'm like, luckily I won't have any downtime. Um, the, the, um, this will kind of all, like we come out June 2nd and then it um, is a platform release. So like every weekend we open in more cities um, throughout like June uh, and then potentially into July. And, and, then, um, and then I go back to life in pieces in August, so there's not a oh, huge amount of. Downtime. Oh, you're so relieved. You're like, Whoa! I'm like, phew. Um, Panned out well, but I. But, but still, life in pieces is not going to take up that much of your time. I feel like it's it's pretty all consuming. I mean, the thing about it is that it's even if I am only working th three days a week or four days a week, um, the hours are pretty like long. Are and there's a lot of sitting around and waiting kind of on set or? They're like for our family days, like there's always like an episode that has like a big family brunch or whatever. Those are really long days because there is a lot of sitting around. When it's just me and Colin or me and one other character, there's not as much sitting around, but you're nonstop going because your story is kind of, you're telling it in like two days. Um, and I think also, I'm, as I mentioned, I like to sleep. Um, and we have like 4.30 a.m. call time. So Ooh, it's kind brutal. of hard, even when you're like doing just three days a week, you're never off that, that schedule. So then like the rest of your week is always kind of like weird. And so you're, you're like, waking up earlier than you want to? Yeah, and just like kind of wiped and on this weird schedule. And are you like a night owl normally or? I, I much prefer sleeping in, yeah, and staying up. I'm so not a morning person. So you would sleep like until what time if you could? I'm like, I love a 10 a.m. <laughs> Sometimes I'll go to 11. This is why I can't have children. That um, is not in sync with your 4.30. No, call. it's very much out of sync, which is why I take Ativan. Um, but I, I, yeah, it's tough. And then also, like, then you have the weekends. It's sort of banal, but it's like, then, like, the weekend comes, and, like, you're going out, and you're staying up late, and then, like, s Sunday, you have to, like, get back on this weird clock, so I think your body just never catches up. Yeah, they up. tell you you're supposed to really stay on kind of, you're supposed to wake up at similar times every I day, know. even if you don't have to be anywhere. That's so, what they say. And the real hippy-dippy people say that you're supposed to wake up with the sun rising. Yeah, well, good luck but with that. those people can just shut up and die. <laughs> so what do you do on your weekends? What are you going out with non-parent friends? You're going um, out with, oh, your husband's name is Daryl? Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, we try to see, sometimes we'll go hang out with our friends at their houses and be with their kids and stuff, and other times we'll go out with non-parent friends, um, like to see movies. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, like dinners, Bor boring. Regular stuff. I don't, I wish I had something. We go to the club, you know, duck club. <laughs> Um, no, yeah. we're not. We're not doing that. But yeah, just like but regular, you're not sitting regular around, couple. Things. And you're not sitting around watching TV. I guess you're saying because it's too. No, no so, sometimes oh, you do. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, totally. So what are your shows? Oh my shows. Um, I obviously love Portlandia. Um, hence, hence Fred, Fred Armisen being in this your, movie. Mm -hmm. um, you had so many cameos, by the way. Fun, I fun, know. Fun. I know. I know. Are these all your friends? Like who you've known over the years? You just a lot of them are my friends. certain people and said, "I need you to just pop into this movie for like a minute." Most of them are my friends. Not uh, Fred. He was in more than a minute, but yeah, most of them were my friends. I didn't. I actually didn't know Fred personally, but um, but most of them were just me texting people and saying, "Do you want to come do this?" And people were just so sweet and supportive, and, and all, they all agreed came to do out. It. Yeah, Colin came and Anjali Cabral from the show and Brooklyn Decker who I was on a show with and Jesse Williams yeah so much fun and there you are like you're an Uber driver yeah <laughs> and Colin Hanks is in your is back my seat Uber it's passenger. Good, good yeah yeah so or your show is getting back to oh, so yeah. Portland what um, else I like Broad City I really like Atlanta um what else uh I watched Girls you know that's over now what did you think of the ending I liked the ending me yeah. too I found it moving mm -hmm. um it was, I, 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 yeah, it was really, it was nice to see the arc of, of yeah. especially Hannah throughout the six seasons um, and in that place. What else? Um, uh, what am I like, a, we, 
There's so much to watch. I know, and it's it changes so, so often because maybe you're like watching one series and then two weeks later you're on to the next yeah. series. So like you forget. But that's what I. I'm find. like, I, I'm like, one season into about twenty five shows, and like it's so hard. I want to just like dig into one, but then I it's so. Oh, dis- you're all over the place. Interesting. I'm all over the place. Yeah. And you have to figure out what your mood is the the day or night that you're gonna watch. Yeah, something. and so much TV right now is so heavy that like. I never really feel like going there. So that's what I think also stops me. Um, I remember like years ago, we went on vacation and we decided to start Breaking Bad on our vacation. Like we were in like this beautiful country house and it was so, in, like it was so depressing, I, but we couldn't turn it you off. You can't turn, you can't turn Breaking Bad off. No, but then our entire vacation was just like in this Ruined. weird like meth studio. So yeah. if you could be on any show right now as a guest star, what would you want to be on? I'm still trying to get on Portlandia. I thought this movie would do it, um, but no I'll, dice? well, let's see. We'll see. Well, this is their final season, so this is my last shot. Did you ask? They're in the writers' room. Um, I feel like I've hinted. Uh, maybe you need to do more than hint. Come out and ask. We have one season left. It's time. I know. What are you waiting for? I know. Kind of between the eyes. I know. I'm scared. And what would you want to do next? Do you think? Um, well, I'd like to write and direct and star again. So you want to keep doing this over and yeah. over again? Yeah, for sure. You love it. I love it. Shall we start the speed round? Okay. Okay, this is just don't think too much. Okay. Sort of like I don't, I'm not good at that. Go with it. You don't have to be good at it. Okay. Okay, worst gig ever. My worst gig ever was um, an ovarian cancer commercial where I had to wear a um, turtleneck with a sweater vest over it and tell my sister on a phone that I had cancer. Uh, for a commercial? For a commercial. For what? It was like for a med- for a medicine. Ugh. It was a bummer, but my but the funniest thing was like when my commercial agent called me and it was like a message and she was like, "Hey Zoe, we got an audition for you tomorrow. Um you are um, a cancer. You are finding out that you have cancer. Dresses casual. Like it's just like so. <laughs> That's classic. Like cool, cool, cool. Not your everyday. Yeah. Uh, cool call. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. You- my craziest gig ever was, but that's probably the same thing. I'm going to eliminate that. I'll give you a different crazy gig. Okay. My craziest gig ever was playing um, a heroin addict on Law and Order that was found dead and rotting in a truck by in a trunk by Chris Noth. Oh, so you were just the Vic? No, I had a part first, but then you know, in like the third act, I was found dead. And what was that like with Chris Noth? Hovering he, over you. He opened the trunk. I had to be so still in the trunk for the first part of the scene, which was like, luckily I'm not claustrophobic. But when he opened the trunk and like they just would find me as a reveal and then the call cut, the first thing he said was, You smell good. I was like, Oh my God, I'm a yeah. rotting corpse, Chris Noth. What? Get out of here. You're Mr. Big and I'm excited. <laughs> Wait, was, 23? He, was he Mr. Big before or after Law and Order? Am I he was really messing up? Before my... he returned to Law and Order after oh. Mr. Big. But this was before the movies. Oh, okay, so no, what? So he was on Law and Order, but he had he was seen on him Law and Order. Then he left Law and Order, did Sex and the City. Then he returned to Law and Order for like one season. Oh, he wasn't having it. But um, okay, Mr. Big, where is he now? What's he doing? What's he up to? Chris? Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, he should be on something. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was your weirdest gig. Uh-huh. Aside from relationships, one major life lesson you've had? Oh God, life lesson. Um, like let more things go. <laughs> I just feel like uh, what don't you let go? Oh, everything. I don't let go of anything. I'm like, holding on to everything right now. What are you holding on to? Whatever. Every little minutia. There's so many things that I think that like just to take personally or to worry about or there's just I think it's just like make life easier. Stop worrying. What do you take personally and worry about? Oh my god, the list is too long. Isn't this a speed round? I don't, I don't know. The, I mean, everything. I worry about everything. So what, like an interaction <laughs> with somebody during the day or something, or future yeah. stuff that you worry about? Yeah, or um, the world coming to an end, <laughs> or um, my health, or the way I look, or... Um, yeah, like the list Very is typical. the list is uh, yeah forever. Okay, and it goes on and on. So is it hard to kind of be in your head all day sometimes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, totally. You do need downtime. I know. 
I'm I need hard it. drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just an interviewer. Okay. <laughs> a few things that are always in my bag. I have a thousand pills and Chinese herbs in my bag at all time. I sound like a Morocco when I walk down the street. Um, uh, what else? I always have like organic hard candies because <laughs> I'm a grandmother. Um, a lot of lip colors. I like to have variety. Never know what kind of lip you want. Um, and uh, a nice hand cream. I like Aesop. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what pills? Oh, I can't. I can't pronounce most of their names. They're they're Chinese herbs. They're like oh, so the pills are herbs. Yeah, the pills pill are herbs in pill form. Yeah. When it's time to decide what to wear, I um stand in front of my closet, talk about how much I hate everything, um, and then like dig deep and find something I haven't worn in a while, and then go shopping. Favorite place to shop is. I'm a high-low kind of girl. Like I'll, I love a Zara. I love a Topshop. I'll, I'll get with H and M, um, but then I also love like opening ceremony, kind of like smaller, um, well curated boutiques, creatures of comfort. Mix it up, high-low. Yeah. When I'm alone in my house, I, uh, I, um, I generally like. Once I'm at home, I'll lay on the couch and like watch something just to try and turn my mind off. Okay, but it's got to be light, otherwise. It's got to be light. <laughs> I know. Don't even get me started on the topic of Donald Trump. See, I'm not starting. You told me not to get started. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Okay. I can't go there. <laughs> We're not going to go there. Okay. I'm addicted to. I'm addicted to. This is so sad. Organic hard candies. I like. I have one in my mouth all the time. And my husband wants to kill me because I chew them. That can be annoying. It's super annoying. Yeah. My husband used to do that in movie theaters. Every time we would go to the movies, oh, no, I never that's not eat okay. in a movie theater. No, you can't do but that. But he comes and he's like, comes into my life. We're young. We start dating, and he's like, oh, we have to get a bag of Jolly Ranchers first. I'm like, Jolly Ranchers. First of all, I don't even like Jolly Ranchers. No. But he and a would whole take bag. one Jolly Rancher. And for the two hours of the film, would chew it? he's chewing on it. And you're still together? <laughs> I don't know how it God was one of those you. moments. Yep, that's a trauma. Uh, I'll tell moment. you what. Does he do it anymore? He doesn't. See, people change. <laughs> Last question is okay. two part. Number one, the part A is, who do people think that you are? Like, what do you think the public perception of you is? Or public or just people you know? Um, ooh, I think people think of me as thick skinned. Because um, I think a lot of the characters that I play are pretty like dry witted, biting women. Um, and I think that I get a lot of people who don't know me, who see me, who know my work but don't know me personally, saying that they thought I was taller, which is always really such a great thing to say to a woman. <laughs> um, yeah, I and would say who, those are two things. Who are you really? Um, I well, I mean, I you know, I'm 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 um, a complicated woman. <laughs> I many things. I mean, I, I think I do. I do. Um, I am also a biting, sort of dry-witted person, which is probably why I get cast in, in those roles. But I'm I'm pretty sensitive also, and and uh, and uh, a people pleaser. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Zoe, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Really Famous. I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast. Whatever app you're using, if you're getting it online, click the subscribe button and that way you'll get every new episode. Definitely follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kara121. And check out reallyfamouspodcast.com. There's lots of bonus features, links, photos, you name it, to the episode you just listened to, but also to other guest episodes. Thanks again for listening. I'm Kara Mayer-Robinson, and this is Really Famous. Really Famous.